This video is a bit different from my usual fare. I'm currently working on a video about CD players, and I shot this footage with the idea of including it. However, as I started watching and editing it, I realized that it really would not go with the theme of that video. It's too long as well. So I decided to edit it as its own thing and put it and just put it out there. I, I found it to be interesting watching my friend Jim disassemble and diagnose my broken CD player was actually kind of fun. It's a bit on the long side, but hopefully you will be entertained and get something out of it. Jim has an electronics repair business in St. Augustine, Florida, where he repairs all manner of electrical gadgets and in particular vintage hi-fi components. I'll put a link to his website in the description below. Please don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel if you enjoy this kind of stuff. I also have a Patreon page where you can get early ad-free access to all new videos. The link will be in the description box below. The CD player Jim is going to take a look at is a California Audio Labs Icon Mark II from 1993. It retailed for thousand dollars when new so it was a pretty serious piece of kit back then. I featured it in a video in 2021 that you can watch where I repainted its rusty top cover. It crapped out on me over a year ago and has been sitting on a shelf in Jim's back room for a few months. Now I told him when I brought it there was no rush which is something I suggest you don't say to any service technician. But Jim is great and he has fixed a few of my other devices since then. And I'm not even sure this is worth fixing, but if it's not too expensive, it may work out. Enjoy the video. You say you're filming this, but you're really just trying to trick me into working on the CD player. I sure am. So what do we have? We have a, it's a California, Audio Labs Icon Mark II. What what, did, what was wrong with this when you brought it in? I when I put it brought it in, it turned on and it just the display went like all zeros and it wouldn't read and nothing. It would just wouldn't do anything. It was just it's not a lightweight unit. A lot of CD players feel like they're you know hollow, just cheap plastic boxes. But this is a this is. Pretty solid. Maybe it's filled with concrete. Nope. I already checked. I checked. I did a concrete check. Yeah. It sure has a lot of screws in it. Sure does. That's a sign of sign of quality. It's, they want to keep the vibrations down. Right. Sign of quality. <laughs> Many screws means it's a high quality unit. And you like English equipment? This is American. This is? Yes. Oh, California. Cal California, Audio. <laughs> California Audio Lab. It's it not British. British. It's not English. Uh... <laughs> Don't you have something else here now that's English? I dropped off that Sony uh, cassette deck. Sony cassette deck? Oh, that. Multi five five. That's Tape. not English either. That's not English. That's I thought for some reason, why did I think that what you brought in a CD player from England at one time? I had an Arcam one. Yeah, that was English. That's what we talked about earlier. Now look at that. It's got the uh, dual, where are they? The dual Burr Brown. This is a circuit board look to me. It looks really nicely laid out. Well, it's a nice, it's a nice circuit board it's here we are. like grounding here are the on um, it. here are the here are the decks i think the left dual now look it's got all wema capacitors in it that's high end is it yeah that's all better than you know having more electrolytics in it or or or, or film capacitors but you know wemas are film but they're they're higher quality is that what those red things are yes oh, okay and the green too so it's made from better quality parts Better quality, com better quality um, <laughs> coupling components. So, what happens here? The display is kind of funky, but it's lit. 
Ooh. It opens up. Put a, if you put a CD into it, nothing happens. Let's see. Let's do that. Can we put a cassette deck in it? A cassette in it? Yeah, you can try that. Try a cassette. See if that works. Uh oh. All right. Well, you know, it may maybe maybe it likes certain CDs and not others. Well, I did try. I, I believe I did try that. Just, the Pretenders. The Pretenders. It's gotta like that. Everyone likes the Pretenders. Play. Does it spin? It doesn't spin. Nothing's happening. Yep. See? CD players suck. What happened to it? Now it's spinning. Now what happened? Anything happen? Does it give me a... Does it say how many tracks there are or anything like that? Look. Is it playing? Yeah. Well, it wasn't playing before. Oh, right, sure. <laughs> it just happens, right? You take the car, your car's making a funny noise, you take it to the garage. And it stops making a funny noise. It wasn't working before. I, t I swear to it. I got... Well, let's look at the... Let's take a look at... What, the, what it looks like. The laser. So now, the first thing we okay. know is that a laser... Reads the disc from the inside out. Yes. As opposed to an LP, which reads the data from the, or no data in an analog. Oh man, did I actually say that? Uh, reads the information from the outside in. Right, and, it, and the speed varies as it as it uh, goes from the inside. It right. speeds up towards the center and it slows down. It's right, and the first thing it has to do. The first track on all CDs is the TOC. Table of contents. If it can't read the table of contents, it you're, won't work. You're screwed. And that's what was happening with this. Don't look down at the laser. All right, what will happen? Well, I'm not sure, but they claim it could is cause... Is it shining right now? Yeah, it doesn't look dirty or anything. But does it shine... Does All the time, or just no, when no, no. When you so it's not going to burn my retina out just by doing this, is it? No. Well, you can get your retina fixed. They have experts now. Yeah, I don't want to deal with that. All right, let's see. Now it's going to come on. See how what it does? That's how it focuses. Mm -hmm. I'll do that again. All right, see that again. See, it always goes to the inside to read the TOC, and then it, it the lens out. goes up and down looking for focus. Oh. Cool. Now, there are little capacitors on this board. I can see them on the laser board. And it's possible that if these capacitors, as they get old, change value, that it gets out of range, that it can focus yeah, properly and such. Mm. So those would be suspect to be changed. And also, I'm noticing something on this. A lot of CD players have a lot of adjustments. One for tracking, one for focus. There's several different adjustments. This doesn't appear to have any adjustments. Because, and like Bose also doesn't have any adjustments, they can design all of that to be automatically adjusted. You think that's what's going on But a here? lot of manufacturers don't. There's no little thing to turn? No little I don't see adjust. any adjustments on this. I'd have to look at a manual to be sure, but I don't see any adjustments. So it would appear that this one automatically... No, 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 no. Right channel, that's an adjustment, and that's an adjustment. But that's digital to analog converter adjustments. There doesn't mm. appear to be anything in here in the actual laser control adjustments which means it's all automatic. That's a good thing? That's a good thing. 
Oh, good. I guess that's why it costs a thousand dollars new. However, right, right, and Bose also didn't have adjustments for laser intensity or. I mean, laser intensity is on the actual laser itself, but they didn't have adjustments for uh, tracking, uh, focus, you know, that kind of stuff, because that was done automatically. But if components change value and get out of the range of where the automatic adjustments can, can compensate, then it may not play at all. Well, it is spinning now. It is spinning now. Let's put it back in. Do you want? Do you think it should? You think it's worth replacing those little capacitors? Well, do you think it's worth I mean, replacing those little capacitors? I mean, if I'm it's not working, paying for it. If it's working, then no. But you know, it's probably not going to be reliable. But, well, I mean, and, and, I mean, I've had it for a year and a half or something. I was using it on and off. See, look at that. It didn't spin. You have to give it a little push? Shouldn't have to. Yeah. So there's something there. Is it the motor? Is it, is it, it, is it a physical the, thing? It could be. Just it needs a lubrication or something? No, you don't lubricate these motors. Oh. But they can go bad. They don't go bad that often. I'm doing this to see if the motor has some kind of dead spot. So you didn't want to start there for a minute, did it? No, I had a little hesitation. Oh, look, see? Uh -huh. So I'm not crazy. Well, I don't know if this proves that you're not crazy, David. Nice, good come, good answer. Yeah, I can't be opening it up the case and giving it a, a little nudge every time I put a CD in. Well, you could, but it would be pretty inconvenient. Well, she can cut a window maybe in the top so of the So I would say that motor is no good. Oh, it's a motor. Right. I mean, I can look at a schematic and see if there's any capacitors in the motor drive circuit, and I can check to see that the, that the power going to that circuit is what it should be. All right. If the power going to the circuit is what it should be because there are some power supply capacitors one of those could be bad causing lower voltage to this motor huh. or it can't always start up but the fact that it starts up and doesn't like to start in certain spots usually indicates a bad motor and but with uh, finding a motor for that would probably be pretty tricky well it's a it's probably a, a standard generic, generic standard. Uh, probably a standard spindle motor. There's a lot of them. Makes Phillips or Sony. Phillips or Sony. They're available. You got to look at the number on it and try to order the exact one. Not such a big deal. The trouble with CD players is that they're all old. You know, a lot of them are old. Let's say. Right, but. And. Aren't they? They still make CD players. Yeah, but I don't know if they make this particular, you know, there's still spares for things that's 20 plus years old. How do we get this door off, man? But that's a good sign that the laser is still good. Yeah. Most of these doors popped up. This one doesn't appear to pop up. Through there, is there? No, no not no. to take the whole tray off, but just to pop the door off. Oops, something just fell out. Nah, you don't need that. <laughs> Extra parts. I mean, I'll have to look at the manual. I, I think I have the manual on this, don't I? Oh. Well, obviously, the most common thing with all of this equipment are rubber belts. If it's got rubber belts in it and it's old, they're probably bad. That usually means that the tray doesn't go in and out properly. 
none of these really use belts for the laser. Uh, other than that, the lasers get old and weak. And they have to be replaced. Are spare parts easy to obtain? Depends. I mean, some are pretty generic and some are not. Uh-oh. See, I closed it. What else can go wrong on a CD player? Well, the problem with replacing lasers is, generally speaking, you're supposed to do alignment. And, and, and what's hard to get now are alignment discs. You can't find them anymore to do focus adjustments and stuff like that. So you're kind of hoping that you put a new laser in and it's still within close enough specifications that you don't have to do an alignment on it. Are and there... on this one, you don't have to because this one's automatic adjustments. But the majority of them are not automatic adjustments. What do you mean by alignment discs or laser? There's a, there's, there are specialized discs. I used to have one. I don't know whatever happened to it, but there are specialized discs. Sony put one out that produce a specific pattern that you can look at with your oscilloscope so that you can do things like focus adjustments and tracking adjustments and stuff like that. And without the disc, you can't really do it. Kind of shooting in the dark. Right. This door should come off somehow because this is not going to fit through here. But it's like a metal door. Usually they're plastic and they pop right off. What else can go wrong in a CD player? Well, anything can go wrong. Capacitors can go bad, you know. Uh, they're pretty reliable with the electronics, but anything can fail. Do you like working on CD players? Not particularly. Why not? Well, because they generally don't have much value. And so... Unless it's a unless it's a high end CD player that somebody really likes and they're willing to spend money on it, then they're often not worth fixing. They go in the trash. They end up in the trash. Oh, you got it. I got that off. Well, there's not the really. belt. Oh, there's the belt. There's the belt. That feels right, actually. It's not too brittle looking. No. Let's get the whole mechanism out. Let's disconnect this ribbon cable. Good thing you unplugged it first. What, the unit? Yeah. You're smart. Well. All these years of experience you learned. It's a habit. To unplug things before you start. It's a, it's a nasty man. little habit. So how do you when you when you open up a CD player, do you often find like really cheap, crappy, you know, construction inside? Uh, generally speaking, I would say that's probably the case. In terms of what the the motor, the capacitors, the, oh, the tray and the, the tray. Yeah, they're all about the same. I mean, this is all plastic. There's no reason to make it heavy duty. This has got weight to it because look at all the steel. Metal construction and metal here. I mean, it it's doesn't have much plastic. It doesn't have a lot of plastic except and for that. The circuit board having all this ground foil is good, and having the higher end capacitors in it are good. Does it really need this solid metal base? Probably not, but the, the, the manufacturer probably saw that there's a market. People actually believe that if it weighs more, it must be better. But would that maybe damp certain vibrations, perhaps? Huh? Would that damp vibrations that mm. might might affect the playback or the sound? I, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I don't think so. Right? I don't know. Some people think that you shouldn't. You know, you should. You should have prevent. Try to. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, reduce the amount of vibrations that components. You know, from from the outside. Mm -hmm. Sure. If it might if, uh, affect the performance. That's why they put these silver thing feet on everything. This has actually got a the, this has actually got an old type crystal mounted to the bottom of this board. Where? Right here. What is it? Is that for the? That's a crystal. For the speed. That's, uh, that's probably for 
microprocessing chips need to be ta need timing, and that's probably timing for this microprocessor. I'd have to look at a schematic to confirm that, but that would be my guess. Microprocessors need to have a reference. Mm -hmm. And crystals oscillate at a very steady frequency. Like, like a quartz watch or something. Right, so that gives it... Is that unusual to see that in this no. player? Wow. Well, a crystal? A crystal like that is unusual to see in anything anymore. Because it's... <laughs> <laughs> that's an old style crystal. Now, how do we get the circuit board off of here? I took the three screws out. Oh, I see. The spindle motor and stuff is soldered right straight through. That has to be unsoldered to remove the circuit board. Oh. Oh, boy. That looks like fun. This looks like fun. What's that? Flux? Yes. The question is, is, is this now becoming not worth fixing because of what's involved? <laughs> yeah. I don't know what this thing is. I mean, if, if, if this thing worked and I tried to sell it, it might be worth a couple hundred bucks. Right, but is that the only value in it? Or does it have value in the fact that you like it? I, no, the only value this thing has for me is right. if I can resell it. Right, in a so it doesn't have much value then. Not, uh, not, not, I mean, I have customers personal. that come in and I, I, I look at a piece of equipment for them and I go, well, this has no value. And then I had one man look at me and go, but I like it. And I feel like that's, that has, that's the value in it. I like it. Well, there's sentimental value. But sentimental value. I didn't, I paid very little for this unit. It was like a package deal I got with some right. other items. And, and, and I'm a sentimental midget. You're not sentimental at all. Right. He might be the less sen well, least sentimental person <laughs> in the world. <laughs> oh my God. I'm a sentimental midget. I'm married Not to, to be confused with a mental midget. Is Sarah sentimental? Sarah can be sentimental. My wife is extraordinarily sentimental. Oh, see. I'm not particularly that. I'm somewhat sentimental. No sentiment. I I pretend to be sentimental sometimes because it's it the pays. Right thing, it's the right thing to do. It pays. Right. Yeah. Like I'm those. sentimental. I cater to other people's sentiment you're, you're, because you're, sentiments are have no value. No, you can't. You can't put a value to sentiment. That's true. You can't put a price tag. Oh, it still doesn't want to come loose. Uh oh, time for the big. Time, time the... to actually see what I'm doing. <laughs> there we go. Techniques. Look at that. Both chips in here are techniques. Nice. Is that good? Yeah. I mean, they're a major manufacturer of things. Machista. It was Machista, really, wasn't it? Yeah. So there's another motor, and it goes through here too, but. And I guess that has to be unsolded to get this out. That's the laser. The laser, uh, what did we call those? Sled motor. So the laser travels on a, on a rail that's called the sled. I have to say this. I like watching you solder. It's, you're like an artist. I once was hired for a company, an engineering firm, just based on my my soldering yeah yeah it, i believe it it's like you're like a you're like a surgeon or an artist i'm a solder bearer by trade you're a soldering fool but that's not helping me right now <laughs> your hands are blocking my view here oh well I'm trying to do it without blocking my view Try to do things without blocking your view. That's right. Is that in the video? Yes. I'll be editing this this down. Oh, you're gonna edit me out. Well, that's okay. I'm gonna edit out the, the boring bits. I have to, of course, I have to include your witty remarks. My comparison between 
between CD players and women's bras. I haven't got to that. Don't oh. go into that. <laughs> you did it. Now, let's... Tell you, you're like, a, you're like an amazing surgeon. Look at that. This is the oh. spindle motor, which is likely to be bad. And these are the capacitors. Could the motor be bad or could the capacitors that control it's it? It's more bad? likely that the motor is bad. I mean, the capacitors could be bad. Not these capacitors, but a power supply capacitor, which I can still check. These, I'm just curious, are 85 degrees Celsius capacitors. Is that good? No. Oh. It to be over 100, right? 105 degrees Celsius right. capacitors lasted longer. These are all 85 degree. So, I mean, I could start by testing a couple of them and see if they test within range. Could a motor like that be obtained? A motor like this can be obtained probably because the number on it is a very common number. It's a 310 a 310 made in Taiwan. It's a 310 made in Taiwan. It's a 310 D-11400. That's a that sounds like a common well, there we go. motor to me. I'm looking through the magnifying glass here with my camera. Does that work? Yeah, it works. I can see it. Huh. Did you see the 310? Well. Oh. Probably. I didn't look that closely. Yeah. So then what's important is spindle height. When you change the motor, you want to try to get this exactly the same height. Is that adjustable? Because you're going to have to pull this off, the shaft, right. to get the motor out. And then you're going to want to put this back on. Any other, any other thoughts you have on repairing CD players? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> if your CD player breaks... Unless it's what? Well, it's like everything else. If it's a very simple thing, like a bad belt or something, fine. But if it's not a very simple thing, then the cost of servicing it escalates pretty quickly. And then you have to decide pretty quickly how far you're willing to go with it and why. Do you want to fix it because it's a CD player in a very collectible boom box? Then you might want to fix it. You know, if it's just a random CD player that you can replace, you can buy a Blu-ray Blu player now for $50 or less, and they play CDs and Blu-rays. So, although I've had some people that have 300-disc Sony changers and all the discs to go with it, so there are different reasons why people fix them. Most people don't. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Sure. Should I should I tell people to come here with their hi-fi gear to get fixed? Always. <laughs> you don't have enough to do. I'm not only the best in town, I'm the only one in town. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me the best in town. It certainly does. Thank you very much.